I was talking to, you know, I've got a, a four-year-old son and if I was trying, I was thinking, how do I explain semiconductors to, to not maybe not a four-year-old, but, but to, to someone that may not be aware of how integral they are in our life? And he was on his iPad and I was thinking, well, the best way to explain it is the semiconductors are the engine of the iPad. To make the iPad work, to make a lot of our personal computers and future technology work, well, semiconductors are going to be the real driving force behind that. The ETF is the ETF Securities Global Semiconductor ETF, and the code is SEMI or S E M I. And as the name suggests, it's, it's quite clear what, what it's giving you exposure to. But really, the ETF, uh, you know, when you drill down a little bit, it's giving you exposure to the 30 largest companies that are part of the semiconductor industry. It's also been an area of significant growth. Um, this particular area. And we've actually seen that, you know, the index that we're tracking over one year to the end of July has had nearly 55% of growth. So really strong returns as well. Now within the portfolio, there are a number of different exposures. So as I mentioned, it's 30 stocks, but you get exposure to the biggest names within the semiconductor industry. What we need to really understand is how integral semiconductors are in our day-to-day -day life. And there's been a lot of focus, I believe, that the semiconductor industry has had um, in more recent months and recent years because of that chip shortage that, that we've had. Now, when you think about the current usage of semiconductors, and what I mean by that is within, I mentioned, you know, whether it's an iPad or any personal electronics, the way in which they're run is through semiconductor chips. Now, Within the semiconductor industry, you have essentially three main buckets. You have a companies that are the integrated device manufacturers, so companies that are designing chips and manufacturing them. You have chip manufacturers or what they call foundries, and that's a company like TSMC, so Taiwan Semiconductors is an example of that. You have then Fabless, so Fabless are essentially just chip designers. And then you have companies that are integral to the supply chain and the value chain of semiconductors. And these are companies such as ASML, and they produce what's called a, a lithography machine. And they essentially have a monopoly on this particular space. Now, to create a semiconductor chip, you need the lithography machine. And ASML are the only provider and producer of such technology. So they essentially you know, really have this, this foothold, this stranglehold in the semiconductor space. Now, the reason why we've seen such a growth in semiconductors or demand has been sort of three main factors. One is, as technology has improved on producing smaller chips that can be processing more power, you've seen greater usage across electric, you know, uh, electronic devices and our demand for electronic devices is increasing. You know, you think about the, I use sort of the, the plane analogy, the invention of the plane once it started to develop the, the technology behind the, the airplane, it allowed for greater connectivity from people around the world and movements of goods. The semiconductor industry is the same. From the first semiconductor chip to where we are now, that technology that's improved upon within that industry has allowed us to have the faster, fastest iPhone, the best laptop, you know, the smart TV that can allow us to stream the Olympics, for example. And you look beyond that and say, well, the future technology, the mega trends are really what's going to be driving semiconductor grow industry growth. So our needs and our demands or our wants for greater artificial intelligence, whether that's in you know, agriculture with tractors and using AI and automation within the food and agricultural industry, or even the home retail market, or even the medical device market in terms of mid-body mid surgery robots, they require semiconductor chips to power them, whether it's your needs for autonomous driving or you know, you know, self self driving vehicles or even electric vehicles. Again, that's going to be one of the biggest growth um, factors within semiconductors because they require more chips within those spaces. When you think about the demand that we've seen, so we've talked about demand from consumer electronics to electric vehicles to future demand, whether it's you know, autonomous driving. One thing that's occurred is an increased demand was there, especially because of COVID. So the past two years, we've seen this increased demand. 
unfortunately, the supply of semiconductors wasn't ready for that increased demand. Now, when I talked about Taiwan semiconductors, now TSMC, it is one of the largest semiconductor chip manufacturers in, in the world. They cater to around 50% of semiconductor global chip supply. They are essentially investing hundreds and billions of dollars in the research and development of their foundries. They have the largest foundry, the largest factory essentially that produces semiconductor chips. To get a foundry up and running, it takes many years and many dollars of investment and capital intensity to do that. Now, it's not something that can be switched on straight away. So that's really important to understand. So there's an idea of capital intensity. There's the other aspect, which is you have the devices or the sort of along that value chain that allow for a TSMC, for example, to produce these semiconductor chips. And that's companies like ASML. So ASML, I mentioned, produces what's called an EUV lithography machine. Essentially, it allows um, the ability to put little transistors on microchips to, to break it down. Now, each of the machines that ASML builds costs about 130 million US dollars. It makes them probably one of the most expensive machines you know, at a cost per machine basis in the world. Now, ASML is known as probably one of the most biggest and successful companies that no one's ever heard of because they're integral to our ability to watch, you know, use the fact that we're doing this virtually, this interview, you know, the ASML lithography machine has been crucial and integral into that process. But to just get that technology up and running takes many, many years. The recent US trade war between China and President Trump, um, or former President Trump came out and said that we're looking to ban the export of ASML machines to China meant that China started to look at, well, how can we reproduce this technology? What they found, and this is according to the New York Times, that it would take them nearly 10 years to get up to speed to the technology that ASML currently has. So that research and development spend, that time lag that you have, you have these factors that are basically built into what has created a supply drain on semiconductors. And what we're finding more and more as we look beyond this is the companies that are involved within the semiconductor industry are the companies that are continually winning and growing. It's a very much a unique industry where there's very high barriers to entry. And a lot of the companies within this space have monopolies or even oligopolies. And it's very much a case of these are the companies to back. And you know that's sort of where we looked at it when we were looking to build um, and bring out this ETF for investors. I think with um, the global exposure to this STEMI ETF, it's really interesting. People always have this view, technology equals US. And to some extent, that is the case with this ETF as well. You know, nearly about 65, 60% of this ETF will have US exposure. So it's companies like Intel, Qualcomm, NVIDIA is, you know, they make the graphic processing units or graphic cards, essentially. Um, and they're, you know, really one of the biggest players in this space or companies like LAM Research, for example. Now, these are the US companies that feature in the portfolio of the 30 stocks. So, so Semi is really 30 stocks, but it is a global space. It's not just the US. So we talked about TSMC, so Taiwan Semiconductors. Now they are the biggest company in Taiwan, sort of the, the champion Taiwanese company, and they feature in the portfolio. So you get exposure outside of the US. You also get exposure to other countries like Dutch, like Netherlands. So the, the Dutch company ASML is an example of that. So when we're thinking about thematics, and it's something that, you know, from where ETF securities stand in terms of building thematic portfolios is you need to either have a sector or a country agnostic view or both. And I think that's important. So this particular ETF, it's global in nature. It has exposure to companies in South Korea, Taiwan, the US, Europe. But still, yes, predominantly, there will be some major exposure to the US. And that's by nature of where a lot of these companies sit and um, are headquartered. I think it's interesting for a number of reasons. Well, one is a lot of people are concerned and they, a lot of people with sort of memories of the dot-com bubble. And yes, there are companies within this particular space that 
were heavily impacted and were probably the major offenders of the dot-com bubble and they're companies like Qualcomm or Intel. But there are two different periods, really, when you consider it. We're talking the late 90s of an area where the need for semiconductor chips was very different to the demand that we have now for semiconductor chips and the position that some of these companies are in. So for a lot of these companies, having higher than average market valuations may be acceptable for investors. And when we look at some of these companies, you know, if I'm talking about TSMC, the PE ratio in July 2021 was trading about 34. Now it's March 2000 PE ratio was roughly around 58. Or if you looked at Qualcomm, which I mentioned earlier, so they were one of the worst offenders, they were trading at a PE of about 350 back in March 2000. In July 2021, their PE at this point is around 20. So what you're finding is fundamentally very different positions that the semiconductor industry is in now than what it was 20 years ago. The other thing to consider is regulation and government support. What you are finding in, you know, in the recent US um, Senate has recently approved nearly $250 billion of support for the techno technology industry. And a lot of that is in chip subsidies because they're finding that obviously there's increased demand for semiconductor chips, they're more expensive. They're trying to subsidize some of that cost for their local um, domestic players to alleviate some of that increased expense. Now, you'll find that with those support and policies, that's gonna drive the continued growth in this space. So you have these multiple different factors that I feel from a valuation side, I think people need to take their blinders off a little bit and say, well, I'm not looking at this industry 20 years ago. This industry has evolved, it's matured, and it's in a very different stage than what it was 20 years ago. And so valuations argument around what it used to be, what it is now, it needs to be sort of considered in that way. I think with growth industries, definitely you do. Well, we've seen that with our, our range of thematics of talking about robotics and automation or battery technology, or even technology in general. I think people need to reevaluate how they view valuations of certain sectors, especially in sectors that are so capital, capital intensive. They're so focused on you know, increased research and development, for example, that they are and may perceive to have higher valuations than what more blue chip or traditional sectors could be. So they need to be viewed in that way versus being viewed with this sort of, let me bucket everything together alongside everything else um, because there's still growth within these companies, even though they have maybe higher than above average from a market perspective PEs. But, you know, looking at companies like TSMC, if they're trading about 34, that's not considerably high relative to what it was in March 2000. And again, in and amongst its peers or in and amongst the growth area, it may be justified as well. A few reasons why an ETF such as SEMI is one of the best ways to get exposure to this, this thematic. Traditionally, as an investor, five, six years ago, you wanted to get exposed to the semiconductor industry. There was really very little way to do that. You're either buying an Activate manager who are, you know, whether that's a managed fund or an ETF or a LIC that may have some exposure to this area. You're either trying to find stock exposure and you buy that overseas. So you're buying NVIDIA in the US market. Now that's fine, but there's single stock risk. You know, which stock is going to be the best performing from that thematic? Is it going to be NVIDIA? Is it going to be Intel? Is it going to be Qualcomm? Is it going to be TSMC? Is it going to be ASML? You know, it's really hard to really choose and have to you know isolate on one or two names the other side is do you just say well i'm getting a broad exposure by buying the, buying the broad market whether that's an s p 500 index whether that's the nasdaq 100 index because invariably you are still getting some exposure to the semiconductor industry by virtue of looking down that path by going broad what we say to investors though when thinking about thematics and thinking about mega trends is if you want a pure play, well, then that's where thematics can help. So if you really want to focus on the thematic of semiconductors, you don't have to think of it, well, I need to try and choose the winner or the loser because you're buying the theme. The theme will win. The theme will succeed. The theme is long-term. So the semiconductor theme and the thematic of semiconductors 
is going to be something that will be with us for decades to come. As long as we're building and producing and innovating in technology, semiconductors are going to be at the heart of that. And this industry will be at the heart of that. So that's why we really feel that for investors, taking an ETF view to diversify your 30 stocks globally, um, stocks as well. So as I mentioned, US, Europe, South Korea, Taiwan, these are all countries that you get exposure to and you're getting exposure to some of the biggest names within this space. So TSMC or NVIDIA, LAM Research, these are the companies that you want exposure to and you're not having to choose between one or the other. You can just buy one ETF or one basket of stocks that, that gives you everything. The semi-ETF is one of the best ways to get exposure to this thematic of semiconductors because we do all the heavy lifting for you as an ETF provider. We're licensing this index from Sol Active, and this index is representative of the 30 largest companies within the semiconductor industry. We've spoken about the fact that the semiconductor industry is really dominated by the biggest players because of that high barriers to entry, the research and development costs, et cetera. And by giving investors an ability to just say, well, I can just buy this theme in one ETF. It alleviates their need to have to go and research different stocks and have to choose. Do I take, you know, NVIDIA over LAM research or Intel over Qualcomm or TSMC? And to that point, it can be very difficult sometimes to get exposure to some of these names. So if you're talking about ASML, ASML produces that lithography machine that we've spoken about, they're listed and they're a Dutch company. Now, some investors may not be able to or may consider some of the you know, tax treatments, et cetera, of investing in European stocks or accessing TSMC's actual stock listing. So we're not investing in an ADR when you were taking exposure to TSMC in this ETF. We're actually investing in the Taiwanese listed stock of TSMC. And again, that can be difficult for the individual investor to do. What I would say there is for investors that want the purest play, this is why we launched SEMI. It was to give investors an ability to say, well, I just want exposure and I want a concentrated exposure to the biggest and the most successful companies in this industry. And it is a pure play in that way. When we talk about thematics, we talk about mega trends. we often say, you're not buying the winner, you're not buying the loser, you're buying the theme. The theme will be what wins in the end. Whichever companies are featured part of that theme, they will benefit from the theme being successful. The theme needs to be long-term and semiconductors, they're not going anywhere. You know, the fact that they're in present technology and they're going to be an emerging technology means that this industry will continue to grow.